Well, hi everyone, and um, welcome to SYP Ireland's webinar on academic publishing in Ireland. This evening, we're fortunate to be joined by representatives from some of the most prominent um, academic publishers in Ireland. We have Noelle Morin from UCD Press, Martin Fanning from Four Chords Press, and Ruth Haggerty from the Royal Irish Academy. So, good evening to you all. Um, so, first of all, we'll just start by doing some quick introductions so everyone knows who the speakers are. Um, my name is Margaret Barley. I am Secretary and Treasurer of the SYP Ireland. And I have shoulder length dark hair and I'm wearing a pink t-shirt at the moment and I'm not wearing my glasses. Um, Noelle, do you want to go next? Um, hello, and um, thanks for inviting me to be participate in the, in the panel this evening. We're delighted. I'm Noelle Morn and I'm the executive editor at UCD Press. Um, Describe, describing myself as very new. Um, I have blonde curry hair, but it's tied back at the minute, and I have a black top and blue eyes. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Ruth, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'm Ruth Hegarty. I run the publishing house of the Royal Irish Academy, and I'm wearing the blue jacket that I hang on my door here in case I have any events, and I have uh, long uh, dark hair um, and greeny colored eyes. Great. And Martin, finally. Yeah, hi, I'm Martin Fanning. I'm the publisher at Four Courts Press. I have now grey hair that's quite <laughs> short, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. Okay, great. Well, um, I won't say any longer. I think we'll just <clears throat> dive right in. So my first question is still in the introductory vein. It's um, how would each of you describe your um publishing houses as publishers what are the kind of books you publish and what kind of people make up your authorship and also your target reader readership so i'll go backwards this time and i'll start with martin um i suppose four courts press are a scholarly or an academic uh publisher mainly um we publish primarily in history and celtic studies some archaeology a few bits and pieces, other bits and pieces, but that would be the core. Uh, we have touched on literary criticism, but find ourselves much more comfortable with literary history. Um, as for our readership, um, a lot of it would be would be academics. Um, uh, quite a few of our books have a bit of a more popular appeal, though, and I think we're very lucky in Ireland in that. Um, that market does exist that for people who will you know are not won't be put off by a um something that isn't just a bestseller kind of a thing so okay great and uh ruth how about you if you want to talk about ria and the work you do there uh yeah well so we're a learned society publisher and it's almost like we have three different publishing um, strands. So we have six research journals that we publish and we publish across all the disciplines in all the strands, but in particular across the, in the journals, so we've maths, politics, um, history, archaeology, um, biology, um, environmental studies. And then we have, um, we have our own research projects and we publish uh, the output of their research. So we have the Dictionary of Irish Biography Online, which would be history. We have the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, which is a mixture of maybe history, geography, and various other disciplines. And then we have an imprint, and we, have, and we publish occasional monographs and scholarly books in, in that line. And then we have an imprint called Prism, which is scholarly always, but aimed at the general public. Um, and our readers would be different for those, each of them. Um, they'd be academic, again. Um, but then the prism would reach a much wider audience and each of those books often is conceived as a public engagement project or a public history project, depending on it. Um, so we would hope that they would meet, reach a wide readership and sometimes they, you know, we have lesson plans, educational plans, so they might reach into schools. Um, but again, we're very lucky with the type of um, buying public in Ireland, I think. Yeah. All right, and Noel, tell us about EC. Um, probably a little bit more in line with uh, Four Courts in, in the description you've given. We, we 
I suppose, define ourselves um, as scholarly trade, which is, I suppose, kind of a little bit of both. We're very much scholarly first and foremost um, as an academic press associated with the university, but really have worked hard at, 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 at trying to work on the general appeal of our, of our books, making them as readable and accessible as possible and hopefully beautifully produced on, on our good days. Um, so really our, our subject area is similar to, to, to Ruth and Martin, um, very much history, politics, current affairs. There probably are our bread and butter and uh, they, they, they consistently we get good proposals and, and good uh, books in those areas. Literary studies, uh, we've done uh, quite a lot of poetry in recent years and uh, with, with, with good success, even though it's, it's very hard to, to, um, to, to get a wide audience for poetry. There's a, there's a really dedicated audience. Um, current affairs, as I said, through that more, I suppose, topical subjects like migration studies, gender studies, um, things that are really happening right now, I suppose, around uh, direct provision. We've had books on, on those kind of areas. And then architecture has been again stemming from history we've had a few good proposals that sort of sit between the two but from that have been getting more architecture so i suppose there's an openness to other areas and we are trying to broad our broaden our list uh, but there are the the core areas that we really feel are our strengths um, and in terms of audience i think very similar to 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 the other answers first and foremost academics and students um, we have a lot of um uh, st study guides and uh, managing your own learning, for example, books that help students with their study and with the research, um, but then also um, books that are very much geared at an academic audience. And then I suppose the work we've been doing has been really to, to broaden that to as many of the general public that are interested in, in books. And there's such book lovers in Ireland and, you know, avid history readers that it's easy to reach that wider audience if the book is, is written well. So I think more and more we have a, a general readership and a younger readership. That's something that I feel is, is happening more and more now as, as we hit topics that are really important. Uh, younger readers are coming to us. Uh, so we're, we widened the, the demographic of the age group as well, I think, or at least we're, we're, we're trying to do that more and more. Mm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting to hear you guys talking about your readership, that it's both academic and also you're very open to trade, whereas I think a lot of um, academic publishers abroad would be very firmly have the shutters down and say, well, you know, if a trade audience wants to read our books, that's fine, but they're not aimed at us. Um, so this kind of brings me to my next question is, um, what do you, how do you see academic publishing in Ireland as being either the same or different to academic publishing outside of Ireland? And on that line, who would you see as being your main competitors outside of Ireland? Uh, I'll start with Ruth this time. Um, well, I suppose a lot of our focus in publishing tends to be on national subjects. So yeah. competitors internationally will be people who publish in those areas. So um, like, I suppose, you, you know, Liverpool and Manchester and Yale and Cambridge and Oxford and, and people like that. But in some ways, the market is there for all the books that are published. And often with particularly I'm thinking of the prison titles that we do with range of the general public. Part of the appeal is to reach um, the audience um, in Ireland and obviously we distribute it internationally. But I think if you if you can capture the imagination of people here, then it tends to have a spillover effect. Um, so that would be. Yeah, that, that so, so that would probably be what we would do with the prison titles. And remind me of the first half of the question. Oh, sorry. I was just saying more how do you feel you can have compare to international academic publishers? Um, oh, yeah. Well, oh, well, that then feeds into the advantage yeah. here is I yeah. and I've done a little bit of work, but it's very difficult to analyze, you know, um, sales internationally and sales here. But I have taken some of our authors who have published with presses abroad and have looked through the Nielsen stats. Um, which come with a lot of caveats, but I have been very pleasantly surprised with our sales figures compared to there. You know, you might see um, with an academic book, you might see a couple of hundred coming through on a Nielsen international press um, in terms of sales, and we'd certainly exceed that, but, you know, by multiple, in one case, many multiples, and another one, maybe we'd have done somewhere around 700 or 1,000 because you've reached that slightly more general market. Mm -hmm. But 
um, it's difficult to compare because um, when you're looking at those presses, they're probably doing a lot of direct sales to libraries, which don't come through Nielsen, which would be the database, which would aggregate all of the numbers um, through bookshops and only through the bookshops that subscribe and, and send in their numbers. So that's why they, they come with a caveat. But I think what we can do is we, we can, if we have an, a, a subject matter that we can capture the imagination, we can find the audience, yeah. we can get on the radio and we can pitch it, you know, do a really good publicity campaign. So I think an Irish publisher um, does a really good job of that. Um, mm -hmm. That's their focus. If the focus is to try and get a general audience, they have to make a noise about it that way rather than through catalogues and library sales which might be the focus of an international press yeah i see yeah that that completely makes sense you have that more kind of individual sales from an irish publisher as opposed to like straight to libraries only from a bigger one uh martin what's been your experience in this area yeah i mean i suppose it would kind of depend on different areas of the list like when we started off we were doing a lot of celtic studies and we just are not doing quite as much of that as we were and then i would have said that there were we there were books that we were from other publishers that we were in direct competition with or our book on the subject there might be one on another on the same subject from another publisher but generally you find that um some of our stuff is so specialized that there is only maybe one book on the subject like the anti nicene christian pash i don't even really honestly know what that is myself <laughs> but i doubt there is another book published on it um so from that point of view the the challenge becomes to uh internationally reach readers and find the market internationally and that is something that, sorry, I've gone sideways in this question, haven't I? Uh, that, that is something that, um, you know, that, that I think that Irish publishers are very well placed to do because we are always used to looking abroad and we're not, we can't survive on our, on our domestic market alone. So we've always had to look that bit further and develop links and develop ways of selling and, and, and reaching people and, and being aware of, of what is going on in other places. Even though we have a very strong core here and we're very, we're delighted with that. Uh, it's a great thing to have, but you have to always be looking at that bit further, I suppose. Yeah, that, that's something I've noticed that a lot of Irish academic publishers doing is reaching out to that um, diaspora studies audience in the US. And no, I'll just kind of bring you in perfectly uh, because I know that UCD Press is doing your distribution through the University of Chicago Press, so it gives you a really good access to that kind of market there and with your so the Clyde book I think that was two or three years ago you know you were even able to travel over to the U.S. and do in-person launches there and really kind of interact with those kind of academics so um what's been your experience internationally aside from all that <laughs> that was a wonderful experience and it's not a common one so we only wish that we had that, we had that experience with every book but yes that collaboration with Chicago was is a wonderful starting point. Unfortunately, COVID came and hit us um, with, with a tsunami wave very soon after that. So only time will tell the, the, the really impact. But I think definitely in terms of profile and presence and learning about the, 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 um, the market on the ground um, and obviously just the capacity, I suppose that brings back to your original question, the difference between Irish academic publishers and international is just the sheer staff numbers, the sheer funding that goes to them it's like we, we literally can't complete and we don't try to and very quickly people learn that we offer something very different um, and I think all three of us probably have the same uh, lines you know we're small but we we do a very personal service and we are very committed to our authors and the relationship that you develop is extremely personal and you very rarely get that not to generalize some, some I'm sure you do but you will get a bit more of a conveyor belt experience with the bigger publishers some of them and that's authors telling us that really more than anything so you might get that big wow but you don't get the deep you know, dedicated, uh, you know, um, understanding and knowledge. And then, as Ruth said, the on the ground knowledge, publicity, the connections with the media, knowing if it's a, a book on County Carlo, who to reach in County Carlo about that book, you know, we can just offer that local experience that you could not get if you were an international publisher. So I think a lot of our books, um, especially the more niche ones, as, as Martin described there, we can do, but nobody else could. And I suppose it's the bigger ones that others could do. We just try have to have to try and do it in a, in a way that we collaborate well with someone like Chicago because we just wouldn't have the reach otherwise because I think we're all small we all have small um, staff very small funding um, so I suppose it's it's making a big splash in a in a very concentrated way. 
I hope yeah. that answers your question. Does it? Yeah. I, mean, I think that's definitely what smaller academic publishers are able to do. They're able to offer better one on one relationships with academics, you know, not hand holding in a patronizing way, but in a way that, you know, someone who's worked a lot of time and spent a lot of energy into their text and they really want someone who cares and can devote energy into it, and not just, you know, a big distribution that maybe won't go anywhere. Um, so on the topic of academics and also funding, as Anna mentioned, um, probably one of the biggest uh, changes in academic publishing over, let's say, the last 10 years has been the growth of open access. So some of you may not be involved in this. Ruth, I know you are. Um, I'd be interested to know, even if you're not involved in it, what your thoughts are on open access, how do you see its future in Ireland specifically? So Ruth, maybe you could start by telling us about your experience with open access. Yeah, well, um, partly I think because we've been in journal publishing, um, mm -hmm. open access has been a factor in our publishing for many years. And um, then as being part of a learned society, we've got this principle that we would like to publish open access. And we have the the privilege and the benefit of getting government funding um, and the authors often are come from universities so they're they're funded as well but the hope the idea would be that it's free for the user to read um, and, and open access not only is that but also that you know how you can reuse the material that you get so you can read the scholarship and then you can also reuse it so long as you attribute um, who, who the scholar was. So we've been experimenting. Um, we haven't arrived at anything final for, for, for most things. But for example, this year we made our Dictionary of Irish Biography, which is a, um, a database of over 11,000 biographies. That's now open access online. And Cambridge, we partner with them actually to, pu to publish the um, physical copies but the virtual is online and you can use and reuse. And we're seeing amazing use of it now that it's open, whereas it was behind a subscription paywall. And so it's wonderful to see that, that kind of thing happening. And the same journal articles, people you know, can pay, used to be able to pay a, uh, a fee to have their article published. And that might come from their research funding. Um, and now we've entered some agreements, like for example, we've entered an agreement with IRO, which is a consortium of the universities, so that over the next three years, anybody who publishes in our journals from those universities will be able to publish their article. And that part of the journal will be free. So you, that article will be free to read. So it, it, it's, it's really exciting. And I think there's a lot of opportunity and funding for academic presses. And I think that it will come from monographs and it will come for journals and we will get there. But there are lots of questions that people have along the way and there are loads of authors who, you know, write these crossover books that are trade, um, but they're also their research. And so how do you go about handling that? And one of the big challenges for small academic presses is how do you even as a publisher get your head around this and move with the times because it's moving really fast and you upskill yourself to be able to offer what authors are now starting to look for. Okay. Um, Martin, have you had any experience in this area? Or Yeah, we're a fair bit behind, I think, uh, where Ruth is in that. Um, we are, we've come across it more in that, for instance, we'll have published a book and someone will come back and say, well, my institution wants me to make a piece of it open access and you're kind of going, Right. OK, well, if we can help you, we will. But, you know, we're only now beginning to get it where at the beginning of a project, come, someone's coming in and saying this has to be open access. And, and we are probably, you know, scratching our heads a bit and trying to work out, well, how what's our role in that? And, and you know, what's the place for us in, in that situation? Because without coming across as a Luddite, which I'm sure I will in this, we got into this to make books, really. You know, there's information. I'm happy to make information available and all, but I don't really get excited about putting things up online. I get excited about making a book and making decisions about making a book and having a physical object. So um, I, it's, it's there. It's something we are going to have to address. Um, I'm really interested in Ruth's point that there are many, you know, there's not one solution, there's not a one size fits all, um, that there's different ways of doing things with it. And um, I, yeah, we're, we're curious, we're curious and interested and open to it, but we don't have a solution yet. 
sure. Yeah. Um, Noel, what has been your experience? I suppose we, yeah, it's very interesting to hear Ruth and Martin's perspective. We're again somewhere in the middle, probably more on 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 the the, the same path as you, Martin. We're observing and getting more and more questions, and we haven't actively changed. The one change we have made is obviously anyone who writes for us from UCD who um, expresses an interest to open access within UCD uh, system, we absolutely grant access, and that's obviously as we're part of the institution, we're a member, we're we're a you know, a, a part of that bigger body, and um, that it's just natural that we would share data and information. So we're in, in that respect, we, we have open access and it's a case by case basis. We'll often have authors come to us and ask, can they have this article open access or can they release it to uh, another university library, for example? And we try to be really fair. We look at how quick, how recently we've published it. And if it really is recent, we'll have that just honest conversation with them that it would need another six months or a year to really cover our costs because we're not in the business of you know, coldly just wanting to make profit. We're an academic press. It's quality and data, you know, sharing and, and knowledge sharing is, is, is the core of what we do. But we also have to cover our costs. You know, I'll, I'll get in trouble very quickly if I don't do that. So it's always that kind of very honest conversation of we want you to have your material and research as widely available as possible. But can you give us the time to really uh, make sure that we've covered our costs? And nine times out of 10, big people agree, authors agree with that. So it might be a year on from publication date or something, or sometimes it's 10 years on, or if it's an older book, we don't mind at all. But if it's something quite recent, we always have that discussion, but it's ongoing, you know, and then in terms of uh, the longer, um, I suppose, response to open access, I suppose in theory or in concept, I have no problem with it because I do believe we're, we're, we're a part of an institution that is about creating ideas disseminating ideas and sharing them and we put that in a book form right now but you know we would be blind uh, to, to ignore the fact that there's different ways of sharing data so much like ebooks coming along and everyone talked about the, the death of the book and it didn't happen we take I suppose a very kind of cautious approach and read and watch and and, and try and make steps very gently and I think we we've entered the world of ebooks but we didn't you know throw out books at, at, while doing it and I think we will it probably will be to use a word we're all sick of, this hybrid model, I would imagine, where it will be a certain act, amount of access and then maybe a certain amount of paid access as well, because at the end of the day, we have to cover our costs, not necessarily make huge profit on a book. Um, you know, and I think that most authors, most authors understand that. And I think even the buying public um, understand that too. And most people really think of something as valuable, especially if it's produced as beautifully as everybody here tries to produce our books they will want to pay for it and own it, even though it might be also available online, you know, and I found that with ebooks, we have a book online, I was really, really worried at first, so they'll just download the ebook and then there's all this work we put into this beautiful book is gone, and of course it isn't the case, in fact we've often found the opposite, someone gets the ebook and they, they see how beautiful it looks and they actually physically want the book afterwards, so I suppose we have to just keep faith in what we're doing, maybe that's an awfully naive um, attitude, but that if we do produce really good quality, very beautiful work, um, it'll still impact, but I think and, and have that discussion ongoing with authors, so nobody feels um, that, that we're restricting their, their, their research being put into the world. Uh, there, there is some sort of a hybrid or a happy medium that we can come to, but in the future, I don't know. Um, anyone's guess? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, when I was an editor and academic publisher, I, it was, we noticed a big trend in Scandinavian universities that a lot of academics there weren't allowed to publish unless it was open access. Mm -hmm. so their universities had a lot of public funding, but it's still, it might not necessarily reach what our threshold was for that. So, um, you know, it is, it is a very difficult balance when somebody comes to you and says, I really want to write something. It has to be open access. And this is all the money I have. Yeah. But um, and I think Martin, you raised a really good point that, you know, anyone who's writing a book, does also want the physical experience of writing a book, you know, that there's nothing compared to that excitement of it and also for the publisher. So, you know, yeah. as, as Noelle says, I think hybrid seems like a more realistic um, future for us. So it's a bit more hopeful future that it's online if you need it, but also you have that lovely process of beautiful books being published. Um, so this kind of brings me on to my next question, which um, maybe we could, we could talk a little bit about the peer review process, um, which is basically what advice do you generally give to academics who come to you and say, I'd like to write a book? Um, no, I'll start with you this time. Um, well, I suppose we very much ask about the content, the ideas, um, and first of all, see if it's, a, if it's a good fit for us. And we're very honest very quickly if it's not 
people come to us all the time with more trade style topics or subject area that we really don't work in. It might be more of the, you know, early modern or um, archaeology, which obviously would be much more your strength, Martin, you know, and it was certain of the, you know, very, very, very uh, beautiful hardback style, you know, that fits really well with the RIA style books or something. So we'd redirect very quickly to the right publisher, but we would always give advice. Um, that's again, I think a function of what we're we're supposed to be doing within UCD is just being offering advice and support to potential writers, even if they don't end up being on our list. Um, so I suppose it's looking at the content and the quality of the writing. Um, and do you want me to go through the stages of, of, of um, I mean, writing uh, this in any way or just more the general advice we would give? Uh, I, I think you probably all have similar stages. So maybe, Noelle, if you want to go through it and then Martin and Ruth, when yeah. it comes to you, you can say maybe if yours is the same or there are subtle differences between the two. Yeah, well, we would have a book proposal form that would be filled out. I'm sure it's very similar for everybody asking the usual questions about the content and breakdown of the chapters and the biography of the person and potential market, subvention, potential, um, all of that kind of thing. Uh, and in, illustrations are not hardback or not. That, and then I would look at that really, I would kind of do the first port of call and I'd know quite quickly if the subject matter or the quality of the writing is there for us to take it further. Um, we then have an editorial committee of a wide ranging number of academics, more UCD than not, but increasingly wider than UCD because we really were very mindful of not becoming too UCD centric. It can be good and bad because if it's all UCD, they all either want to publish each other or they don't because they, you know, for whatever reason they might want to. So just to be as, as fair and, and, and balanced as possible, we have academics from different um, institutions and, and also abroad now. Um, so that's really improved the kind of fairness and openness of our decision making. Not that we always get it right, but we try to. So really the proposal with some sample chapters would come to that committee and it's discussed very openly and very widely. And if there's somebody on the committee with expertise in that subject area, they would maybe have more influence. But if there's nobody we would find, we, we still do find two independent readers for every book um, and they have the right to remain anonymous. They can be really, really, really thorough and really, you know, um, harsh if they need to be. Um, and and that, feed, that information would go back then to the potential author. And if the, the I'm sorry to just take a step back, the full manuscript would be sent to the readers. Um, and if there's two positive readers reports, then we sign a contract and we proceed with the copy editing and proofreading and put it on our list for, for the next season or a couple of months on. Um, and if there is bad feedback for one reader's report is bad and one is good, we find a third reader. So we try to be really fair. And, in, and if it's all a negative, um, we still always make it really clear to the author that the reading process, the peer review process will really help them anyway. It might be a, a tough pill to swallow, but most of the time they thank us because it makes the book better and they might publish with somebody else, but they've got really good feedback from experts in the field. Um, so we feel we haven't done it, done, you know, an injustice. You know, you then see it in the world published by somebody else and, you know, you kick yourself why, do you, why, why, why you had to say no, but I have to respect that, that, that that's, that, that's our process and that's one that's generally worked for us in terms of maintaining quality. Um, but you do have to let go of things that you don't want to sometimes. <laughs> Um, you know, but that's, that's the nature of, of the process to try and make it as thorough as possible. So you get the full manuscripts before you get them to sign the contract? Okay. Well, we can uh, agree in a conditional contract that comes up quite a lot, understandably so. Authors don't want to put in all that effort only for us to say no. So we'd often sign a conditional contract. It's not always the case, um, but, but it's a very clear clause and it's that if it doesn't pass the peer review stage that we won't take it any further. And if it does, then the author has that security to know that we're following on with the full contract then. Okay, great. Um, Martin, does your process similar? Very, very, very similar, yeah. Um, um, it, the, the peer review is a, um, it's one of the more challenging areas, I think, of, um, of academic publishing in getting people to do it is, it's, it's a tough ask to, to ask someone to look at somebody else's work. And really, I mean, you can offer them a, a nominal fee and it really is just, we can only really afford a nominal fee, but we're sort of operating under the assumption that should they have a work, it will come around and, you know, someone will do it for them. And that's a lot of goodwill to ask of people. And if you have a, a quite a small uh, or a very specialized subject area, I mean, really, they're, they're, the person who has written the, the book might be the person to do the peer review. Which, you know, obviously, you can't, you can't do that. So I would say we spend an inordinate amount of people, our time, trying to find 
good peer reviewers for our books. We'll take, we take advice from our editorial committee, but you know, we do often give um, potential authors the, the right or the, the opportunity to suggest reviewers. And also sometimes people who they don't want to review the book. Um, okay. But no, you, that's, you know, it's, a, it's an odd one if it's a very specialized area and you have to, uh, your diplomatic skills are often called upon, especially if you, if you have um, one report that goes one way, as Noel mm -hmm. said, one that goes another way. Mm -hmm. and then you're going, right, do I have to now spend another? And it can take six months to get a yeah, absolutely. Yeah. reviewed. And you're just thinking, look, do I just tell this person it's not for us and let them go on? And Or do I say, well, we can wait, you know, if you want to wait six months, I'm happy to submit it to a, a, another reader. And here's what we've gotten from our first two. And then what happens if you get two readers reports that contradict each other, which we have in the past we as well. Yeah, yeah. And you're looking at it going, right. <laughs> and then you also get the situation sometimes where you really want to do a book and you think this would be fantastic. And you get two reports and you just have to go, no, yeah, okay, we can't. Absolutely. We've asked people, we've got advice. We can't go against it. Even though you know you could sell it. No, but anyway, and then somebody else publishes it and yes, you go, oh. yes, we have lived that. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> That's the kind of great rigor about academic publishing compared to trade, where trade is like you're only thinking about sales, whereas academic yeah. have this yeah. other standard. Um, Ruth, what's yours? Because obviously you work in journals, so that can also have a more complex system as well. Yeah, um, the journals are double, all the articles are double blind peer reviewed, um, except in a couple of subjects where that's not normal. Um, but, and I love the game that reviewers and authors play to try to guess who the reviewer was or guess why and, and especially in the small and um, like the more specialist disciplines people know that absolutely working on such and such a subject and so they know now that this book has come in but you know we've done the due diligence of removing all the names where we can um yeah so no so it's, it would be the same in the journals every article gets sent to two reviewers comes back and if they're both accept you accept and um, often there'd be minor revisions except with major revisions um, and, and confidential comments to the editor and um, feedback to the author that we share with the author and um, yeah and in the case of the journals it's the editors that make the decision um, in the case of books we, we publish very few unsolicited books um, so we would have very few proposals coming through in that way. Like we might just assess only about that 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 make it to our publication committee. We might only assess about eight or ten proposals in a year that would kind of make the publication committee. Um, because the rest of our publishing is kind of set or is or is commissioned. But it's the, yeah, all double blind peer reviewed. Yeah, so um, sorry, books are double blind peer reviewed as well. Yeah, we would send the book out. Yeah, in the same case as, as the others. So they would go out and the readers' reports would come back and then you'd work with the authors on the comments and then you yourself would have feedback as well, especially with the illustrated books. There's, there might be an awful lot of suggestions you want, might want to make about the structure and the reframing of it. So yeah, you'd give feedback at that point as well. And we would accept in, the same, in a similar way, either on full manuscript or subject to peer review and funding, which would be the other thing that we'd often have to look for. Okay, great. Actually, um, uh, Ruth, you hit on an interesting thing there. Um, between uh, you, Noel, and Martin, what percentage of books would, would you say are unsolicited versus ones that you go after and approach the, the author yourselves? Uh, Martin, if you want to. <laughs> um, so uh, I think what we find is we do collections of essays quite a lot and um, that, that, you know, that often will lead then to we'll read something in and go, well, yeah, that, that, that was actually very good. There's, there's more, there's more to be done there. So um, I get in terms of percentage, I mean, Oh, I don't need a firm figure. <laughs> yeah, I would say, I would say that we get, an awful lot of book proposals in uh, the majority of which are not for us in the first instance so to go back a bit on the process the first thing we would do would be weed out things that we just don't do we we, we don't do poetry uh, we're not the right people for certain areas we won't we don't touch anything to do with James Joyce because you know there's people who do that and do it very very well um, and then there'll be you know after that 
we're, we're probably, I'd say 60% of the proposals we get are just not for us. And then there is 40% that we will look at internally and then think to ourselves, right, well, there's something in that maybe. And out of that 40%, maybe we might have send, um, I don't know, 20% of them for, for peer review. So that probably, no, that's going sideways on it. I guess we probably, 30% we commission and about 70% we would um, get as. So it's a lot of anyway. <laughs> Um, Noelle, would you say? I, I think it's similar to what Martin's describing. We get a huge amount of unsolicited proposals, but the vast majority are not for us. They're fiction. They're um, really, I don't know what you put them as. Some of them are yeah. just very interesting um, musings on the world that I don't, we don't really know where to direct them sometimes. But we always try and be positive and, 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 and give positive feedback if we can. But huge amount of unsolicited, but then lots that are possible books for us. So it is an awful lot of um, my work is that really getting through that and making sure they get the right response and assessing whether it, it does go to committee or not. So I would say similar to Martin, probably 70, even 80% is unsolicited. And then there's certain things that we target, like we have a book on migration and it really was hitting a button. And then we would actively have a chat with the author and say, there's more on this chapter. Would you really consider responding that? So it would be gentle soliciting, I suppose. <laughs> we can't be really blunt about it because there's a committee so I could say this is a great idea I'd love a book on that which I want to do all the time of course but I'm not allowed and there's limits um thankfully probably for the, for the press to my power but I can gently suggest and then the committee obviously ultimately decide and the readers decide but we can certainly lead on from other successes and we've done that many times we had a book on food science which you'd never done before and um on uh, GMs and food and organic versus non-organic and then led to another one on obesity so they were a natural follow-on that we pretty much commissioned um but we would generally it would be authors to speak to each other and say that went well how about going to the press again for this you know so we would definitely get certain uh waves from 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 departments and, and certain authors who come back thankfully because they've had a good experience which is i suppose the biggest compliment isn't it um yeah i would say more at 70 to 80 would be unsolicited but within that there's a huge amount that wouldn't be for us yeah mm. um i suppose my next question is kind of a, a summary up question it's my second last one mm. um if you could go around and give maybe one major challenge you see for academic publishing in ireland and then maybe one opportunity you see in the future uh martin if i could start with you mm. thanks um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> so glad to <you>, martin <laughs> <laughs> One challenge for academic publishing in Ireland. Um, hmm. Well, open access is definitely a challenge um, and finding a way of dealing, dealing with it. Um, sh shrinking markets, I suppose, in some ways are, are a challenge. I mean, you know, it's harder in some ways for an Irish academic publisher in that we are held to um, extremely high standards and we should be. But we also have, I mean, this is a ludicrously small detail, I suppose, but the fact that we have to give 13 copyright copies annoys me like nothing on this earth, as opposed to two in the US. And I just, I calculated on six in Britain. So, you know, our, we're, we're small in scale, our margins are tight. And that's essentially 15 grand's worth of books we're giving away more than our equivalent in England, which doesn't sound like that much. But you have to pay to, you pay to get them there as well, which yeah. is sort of irritating. Oh, postings, that's that's a big uh, that's a big issue ongoing now. I mean, it's uh, I'm probably more so for an academic publisher because although all three of you, a lot of your books would still be appearing in bookshops in Ireland, a lot more people are ordering them online and you've got yeah. to be able to so. we posted a book the other day to the US and it was 50 euro and yeah, that. yeah. And you have to fill in those new forms, those new ridiculous forms you have to fill in now. Yes. Where, I mean, so it's 10 minutes of your time. I mean, this is, yeah, this was something we found over the pandemic that our, our web, sorry, this is going sideways, our web sales yeah. went way up. But it actually was, I won't say it was a problem, but we had to kind of restructure it in doing things because you were having to cart parts to the post office and then, you know. Filling out all these forms. Filling out all these forms. Yeah. But these are the customs forms. So if yeah. you're sending yeah. something to the UK or to That's the US, right. you have to fill out yeah. a form for each one. Yeah. And because of our size, you can 
we thumb post, have a little automatic online yeah. thing to do, but we're too small. So they yeah. won't, uh, you know, it's it's difficult to sort those kinds of things out. So there's an awful lot of manual work in that. That's a challenge, I think, actually. Yeah. 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 I would fully agree with you is how to get the books. I think we should publish lighter books. Our books are very <laughs> heavy. <No>. Very heavy. <laughs> develop lighter paper so Ruth I suppose um postage distribution is one of your challenges any kind of yeah our size change is a challenge you know adapting and having the space to work out um how to adapt and 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 how to take advantage of, of new things so I'm going to pick then as the opportunity I do think open access is an opportunity yeah. um, very positive outlook <laughs> and I think it will work its way out and I just hope it doesn't squeeze out all of the small people in the process and I do know that there is an awareness of that that people want to keep the publishing landscape diverse but in the same way as large companies can squeeze the book buying market I think there's a risk that that will happen because with open access if you charge a fee and you can accommodate volume then you can make money but if you can't accommodate the volume and your and your costs then um, make it difficult. It could be a challenge, but I I I, I do honestly think that if you can from the get go, you just don't do them if you can't achieve the yeah. access element. So if you're thinking about it from the beginning, I think it's a, an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, uh, DCU press is open. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see how they happen. You know, I mean, a lot of. A lot of li libraries are, are setting up presses, so it'll be interesting to see their longevity. Will they will they hire editors and copy editors, and will they get involved in that process? Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, okay, Noel, what would you say your challenge? Yeah, very <laughs> similar, yeah. Open access, I would say, um, difficulty, but I'd like to believe it will be an opportunity. So I'm going to trust you, Ruth. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's always survival, really, I suppose, in our position, it's, um, you know, it's always justifying your existence and you're producing hopefully good books and quality books and getting great reviews and people coming back to you and all the ticking all those boxes. And yet you still have to just hope that they university, not specifically our university, but all universities who have presses, the next new manager, the next new president and the next new government body believe that you should be there. So that's a reality, not just for the press, but for smaller departments or additional departments within universities as universities, um, I suppose, identity changes. Um, and I think that's an ongoing concern for a lot of academic presses, not just here, but I know speaking with the UK publisher, publishers and North American publishers, it's a very real fear. Um, we're so small, I suppose, and we don't um, cause too many eruptions that it's a very small, you know, a, you know, um, thing to, to, to add in but I think the bigger ones are very fearful because they would have big staff and a lot of subventions and they would be costing the university a lot so I think they're quite exposed actually if things start to go wrong or this cost savings needed or priorities change within the university which is you see more and more in, in, um, in the landscape of, of, of university development um, but I suppose I'd like to be hopeful too there's an opportunity in that that if you can show that there is real value in, in what we do um, and I think there's, you know, challenges ahead, I suppose, in terms of um, how Ireland's changing and the books we're producing. It's very Irish city centred at the moment for all of us, probably, but there is such a changing um, population and uh, people's ideas and beliefs are changing all the time. Young people think, care about different things. So I think that's we, we've moved more into subject areas that we think that are really, really topical, but not just now, will be for many, many years to come. I suppose migration being a very obvious one. So it's, I suppose, moving with that, as any good publisher should, with, with those changing um, ideas of what it is, what Irish studies is, or what it is to write about Irish topics. But I, I would see that as an opportunity rather than a challenge. Absolutely. You really have to stay on top of it and yeah. keep doing your research, keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on in academia. Uh, so my last question in our last five minutes is uh, hopefully just a nice one. Um, I do, it, the course of your academic career is there a particular book that stood out to you it's meant a lot to you either from working on it or just you know in particular just uh struck a chord with you um Ruth maybe I'll start with you oh yeah it's hard to choose but I suppose yeah. when I find myself on eBay obsessively searching for things um, and find things late at night then that's probably one of the books that I would 
choose um, Dublin 1911 is a book that I worked on, which was um, a collaboration with the National Archives. It was edited by Katrina Crow, and it became a labor of love. So we had these, we had these short articles um, about life in Dublin 1911, drawn from the data from the census. Um, but we decided to create the feeling in the book of what it might have been like to live in Dublin 1911. So we had a lot of ephemera illustrated with an awful lot of archive and it, it was part of the process of discovery for me that people love to see and feel and judge for themselves so we had a another series of books called judging which do the similar thing so if you if you refer to a letter you can read the actual letter in the person's handwriting or you can see in Dublin 1911 you can see the ads that you might have seen if you'd opened the newspaper in 1911 and you were living in Dublin or you could see the clothes or you could see you know read the letters or see James Joyce's postcard frustrated that he hasn't published his book yeah so that yeah Dublin 1911's book. Wow beautiful book. Amazing. Um Noelle is there a particular one for you? It's me is it? Yeah um a very very difficult choice God I'm if, if any of the authors watch I'm terrified. <laughs> Um, all of them, all of them, is not the, the, the PC uh, Well, I, I would say actually influenced maybe a little bit by Ruth's um, description there. It's one book that wasn't just the actual content, it was the putting together of the material and then the extra material that we, we, um, we were always very impressed by the, the quality of the design in RIA books. And I suppose we tried to improve our design. Um, just to give you a bit of competition now, uh, just, to, yes. just, just to make our books more nicer. Um, but, but one particular book, I think that was the beginning of that for us was The Real People of, Joyce, of, of, of um, Joyce's Ulysses. Yeah. And it was one that actually, going back to er, an earlier comment, went through the committee and was, um, there wasn't question marks as to the quality, but there was question marks as to whether we were the right publisher. There's obviously certain publishers that do a lot of Joyce and do it very well. And whether we were the right fit, um, everyone you know, recognized the quality of the research and the writing. And I prayed it would go through because I really personally wanted to work on it. Um, uh, and I did. Um, and, uh, and it was just the putting together of that material. And it was, again, it was such a different perspective. There's so much written on Joyce, but it was the actual smaller people within Ulysses that actually were real people of Dublin. And it felt like a, local history book mixed in with a who's who it's for some people who came to the launch that were relatives of people in the book it was the most extraordinary launch because people kept coming up going my great-grandfather is in page 72 extraordinary feeling of this gathering of, of Dublin's quirky characters um, and it just showed I suppose that fiction isn't fiction it's so so grounded in, in factual life lived experience and Joyce no better man to do it and I, and I think there's the actual physical um, presentation of that book, again, really as a nod to the sort of work that RIA do, we really try to work on the look and, and in, in bringing in the images and making them as beautiful as possible. So it was very tactile as well. Um, that was a, 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 a game changer for us in terms of, of our type of publishing, I think. And also it always helps that it sold really well. <laughs> that was the last most important part, but I still would have loved the book, even if it didn't sell really well. But it seemed to hit an, a note with Joyceans, which you hope you will, because they can, they can be harsh if you don't, but also with the general public. And then anybody who had a relative in it or pretended they had a relative in it wanted a copy of the book. So it felt like a really you know, a celebration of Dublin people or something. And I love that about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. A, lo and a lovely author, which always helps. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's an excellent choice. Uh, Martin, if you want to follow that, if you got to... <laughs> I don't know if I can. I mean, I, I should say the next book I'm working on, but uh, the one that really does stand out was a couple of years ago, we published uh, a book on an Irish stained glass artist called uh, Will <laughs> Nigetis by Nikki Gordon Bow. Mm. who um, was an NCAD, she died a couple of years ago. And that book probably was being talked about 15 years ago and we were getting letters and maybe a chapter would appear and then it would be taken back. And then there would be discussion about funding and potential this and where would we get images? And it just went on and on. And I don't say that in a bad way. I just meant that it was a long process. Mm -hmm. And we started off with a manuscript that was 400,000 words. Uh, and we, you know, had to get it down and no, Nikki, you know, you found these wonderful diaries, but we can't put all of it in there. And even though, you know, and then there was the search for images and um, dealing with stained glass images is interesting because a lot of them were in um, churches and places like that. And from when they were installed since then, the physical 
the shape of the church has changed, the trees have grown behind them, uh, mm -hmm. someone's planted some plaster in front of them. So it just became this, it was just mm -hmm. this incredible jigsaw puzzle of search for images and Nikki was pulling in favours from this person and that person and it just went on and on and on and it was ridiculous and wonderful and in the end it pulled together into a very attractive book and we sent it to print and we started what prayed it was going to you know come out okay mm -hmm. and like we had instructions for the printers like the spinal tap thing turn the black up to 11 because you need yeah. you know if you're doing stained glass you have to have like black 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 and mm -hmm. we opened the first page of it and it looked like it had dandruff on it mm -hmm. and we just thought oh, oh my god and so we called the printer up and said what have you done to our book and he said just blowing it it's just the cutting from the machine <laughs> Oh it was beautiful, gosh. but it was wonderful. Really? Exactly. But I, I, it nearly, it was, it nearly killed me in terms of the worry kind of a thing when we saw it at that stage. But, but I would pick that one because I enjoyed it and I really enjoyed working with the author. Yeah, it's an amazing book. That book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so great memories as well. As yeah. Great. So very excellent choices from everyone. Um, so that brings us up past forty-five minutes. So um, I just like to say again, thank you all for sparing your evenings and for coming to chat with me um this will be hopefully up on youtube some point next week and we'll send you out the link and then we'll we'll try and do our best to share it with as many people as possible and i'm hoping that both academics and um uh publishing hopefuls will watch it um speaking of which if you are publishing hopeful and you're watching this thank you and if you're not already a member of SYP Ireland, I would definitely encourage you to consider joining. You can see the information on that on our website. Uh, perks of joining include webinars like this. We've been doing a lot online, obviously, this year. We're hoping to do a hybrid approach in the coming year once it's safe to do so. We definitely want to try to do an in-person event before the end of the year. Um, we have a regular newsletter that go around. We also do a regular book club. We were doing it once a month. We're trying to space it out more so that people have more time to read the book. Um, so it's not a onerous uh, task for anyone that it's a fun thing. We're all very welcoming. And we're, we really would enjoy hearing some different voices in our book club. Um, yeah, so please do follow us on Twitter and consider joining. So with that, I will leave you all. Thank you again for your time. And good night. Bye. 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 Thanks to speak with you. Bye. Bye.